Hello, and welcome to Meet BOA Authors with Writers and Books. My name is Dan Hurt. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, a bookstore, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. We're so happy to collaborate with BOA Editions to bring you readings and conversations with their fall slate of authors. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. Writers and Books would like to call attention to the complex and troubled history of the lands on which we live and work. We are hosting this event from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Onondaga, or the people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as the Seneca people, or the keeper of the Western door. We're so happy to have Craig Morgan Teicher with us tonight. He'll be in conversation with author Peter Connors, publisher and executive director of BOA Editions. A seminal voice in American prose poetry from the 60s onward, Russell Edson's career is surveyed in a single new volume, presenting a new and contemporary view of a poet of startling imagination and strangeness. Editor Craig Morgan Teicher calls us to witness Edson's unique moral and comedic vision, whose oeuvre quietly yet definitively shaped the prose poetry subgenre as we know it now. Craig Morgan Teicher is the author of four books of poems, Welcome to Sonnetville, New Jersey, The Trembling Answers, recipient of the 2015 Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, and To Keep Love Blurry, and Brenda is in the Room and Other Poems. He also wrote Cradle Book, Stories and Fables, the chapbook Ambivalence and Other Conundrums, and We Begin in Gladness, a collection of essays. He edited once and for all the best of Delmore Schwartz and serves as poetry editor for the Literary Review. He is a 2021 recipient of a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation. Craig, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I am delighted. Uh, is it, am I, am I on? Is this it? It's all, it's all you now. All right. Uh, well, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. I see some of my students and former students, uh, names, and I am grateful to you for coming. And if I owe you emails, I apologize and I will send them. Um, so, uh, I'm going to read a little bit from this book, uh, Little Mr. Pro's poem, the selection of poems of Russell Edson and Peter and I will talk about it in a few minutes, but, um, just I'll, I'll say quickly that, that Edson was one of the first writers I fell in love with when I was a teenager. Um, I first heard about him in the, uh, the book Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg, which is a writing book that got very famous in the 80s that kind of synthesizes Zen and, um, and, and writing practice. Anyway, she, she quotes a bunch of him in there and I just thought it was the best thing I'd ever heard. Um, and so then I went out and got, um, his earlier selected, which is called The Tunnel. Um, and then, you know, he he published three more books after that and passed away, I think in 2012. Um, and I just thought it was time for the, the world to get a chance to take another look at him. And, um, and yeah, Peter and I will maybe talk about why, um, but until then, I will just read from the book. Uh, so I'm going to start with, so these are just some of my favorite poems. Um, I think a couple things to know about Edson are that he um, has a very scatological sense of humor um, and he is, uh, he always writes in prose, uh, hence the title and, and, um, and also that he, uh, he's really obsessed with the dynamics in small families between, between long married couples and their children. Um, and he doesn't have a ton of faith in uh, in marriages, at least as evidenced by the poems. Um, all right, so I'm going to start if I can find. Yes, here it is. Okay, so this is a this is a poem called "The Way Things Are," um, and it's a pretty good example of what an Edson poem is like. The way things are. There was a man who had too many mustaches. It began with the one on his upper lip, which he called his normal one. He would say, this is my normal mustache. But then he would take out another mustache and put it over his real mustache saying, this is my normal mustache. 
Then he would take out another mustache and put it over the other two and say, this one's normal. And then over the other three, and then another over the other three saying this one's abnormal. After several more layers, he was asked why he wanted to have so many normal and abnormal mustaches. He said, it's not that I want to, it's simply the way things are. Then he took all the mustaches off. They like a rest, he murmured. The first mustache, which we thought was real, was not. We mentioned to him that we thought his first mustache was real. He said, it is, all my mustaches are real. It's just that some of them are normal and some of them are abnormal. It's simply the way things are. So that's a, that's a, a sort of a, a later Edson poem. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump around the book. The book is organized in terms of his original books because I think that's the best way to do it. Um, but I'm gonna jump around for, for some sense of flow. Um, this is probably my favorite Edson poem ever. Um, and I actually teach it a lot. Um, and in the back of the book, there's an essay in which I sort of talk about it a bunch, but I think it's a really good example of, of a kind of, uh, of fiction in microcosm. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a little, uh, just a, it has all the buttressing of a, of a short story. Um, so here is the large thing. A large thing comes in. Go out, large thing, says someone. The large thing goes out and comes in again. Go out, large thing, and stay out, says someone. The large thing goes out and stays out. Then that same someone who has been ordering the large thing out begins to be lonely and says, come in, large thing. But when the large thing is in, that same someone decides it would be better if the large thing would go out. Go out, large thing, says the same someone. The large thing goes out. Oh, why did I say that, says the someone who begins to be lonely again. But meanwhile, the large thing has come back in anyway. Good, I was just about to call you back, says the same someone to the large thing. They're kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of fables, um, without the moral or something, and or the moral is always kind of bad news. Um, another thing that Edson was really obsessed with, um, I feel like I should be telling you more about him. He lived in Darien, Connecticut um, with his wife, Frances, to whom he was very devoted. And he was also a visual artist. So he, he this is a, a painting um, that we use for the cover, but he also made sculpture and, um, and paintings and other things, uh, uh, a lamp um, that, that sort of aesthetically mirror the world of the poems. Um, he was a strange guy and he didn't, um, you know, he, I mean, he, he did readings and, and did poetry things, but he wasn't, you know, exactly on the front lines. Um, he, was, he was a close friend of Charles Simic who wrote the foreword to this book and also of James Tate and in the seventies, they sort of all passed poems back and forth and kind of developed the prose poem uh, kind of as we know it. Um, so he, he's, he's also really obsessed with monkeys. Um, and so this is a poem about a monkey. It's called The Family Monkey. We bought an electric monkey, experimenting rather recklessly with funds carefully gathered since grandfather's time for the purchase of a steam monkey. We had either by this time the choice of an electric or gas monkey. The steam monkey is no longer being made, said the monkey merchant, but the family planned on a steam monkey. Well, said the monkey merchant, just as the wind up monkey gave way to the steam monkey, the steam monkey has given way to the gas and electric monkeys. Is that like the grandfather clock being replaced by the grandchild clock? Sort of, said the monkey merchant. So we bought the electric monkey and plugged its umbilical cord into the wall. The smoke coming out of its fur told us something was wrong. We had electrocuted the family monkey. Um, the, the poems often end like that with like a kind of, and they're, they're sort of tautological. They, they, he likes to restate, um, to, to restate things. Um, you know, he, he his world is one in which there isn't really 
uh, progress and people don't really learn things. They just repeat their mistakes and he has a lot of fun um, making them make their mistakes. Uh, so this is a, a poem about a nostril. It's called The Nostril Affair. His left nostril was visiting in his right nostril and he was feverishly swatting flies, hoping that one of the flies was not a fly but the dark of his missing nostril. At last, despairing, he drew a dark spot on the left wing of his nose with a pencil. Suddenly, his, his left nostril crawled out of his right nostril, and he saw that he had three nostrils. He erased the extra one. He heard a scream. My God, my God, I've killed a nostril. The dead nostril fell to the floor. His other nostril crawled up into his nose. Even the pencil mark edged out onto his cheek, pretending to be a beauty spot. He called the nostril hiding in his nose, oh, please come out. It was all an accident. He even called to the pencil mark, please do not be afraid. I will buy you an ice cream cone. Um, so Edson, I'm gonna read now a poem from his first book. Um, the weird thing about, you know, I mean, it, it's funny to be doing a virtual event um, I'm glad we're still doing them in the world. I think that they're useful, uh, but there's always that weird sort of deafening silence uh, of, you know, I mean, if we were in a room, we would probably find these funny together, I think. Um, and so it's a little strange to be, to be here all by myself. Though so maybe um, I'm trying, I'm hoping that my dog doesn't figure out where I am. I'm in an unusual place in my house because if she comes, she doesn't, care about poetry and will not be interested in um, helping me to read. So hopefully she doesn't figure out that I'm here. Uh, so this is an early poem. Um, it's in uh, first couple of books were sort of fine press editions in the early 60s and then um, New Directions uh, kind of brought those books together with some new pieces. Um, into a book called The Very Thing That Happens. Um, and it, it's also full of Edson's drawings. And I mean, it's long out of print, but uh, if you're ever in a used bookstore and you see it, I recommend you pick it up. Anyway, this is called The Fetcher of Wood. And this is one of those poems about a couple that just can't really get along. An old man got into a soup pot and shook a wooden spoon at the sky. When he had finished, he went upstairs to his room and died. When his wife came home, she said, stop being dead, there is no reason for it. He got out of bed. So you're dead, what of it, she said, I have no patience with you today. Go fetch wood for the stove. He collapsed onto the floor. Oh, go along with you, you can at least fetch some wood. She kicked the corpse to the stairs and over the edge and it fell to the first floor. Now fetch wood, she screamed. The corpse dragged itself out of the door. Spiteful old man, she said to herself, died just to get out of fetching wood. The old man's cadaver was trying to chop wood. The ax kept slipping out of its hands. The cadaver had cut off one of its legs below the knee. Now the cadaver came hopping on one leg into the kitchen, carrying its leg. Oh, you've cut my old man's leg off, she screamed. And she was so angry that she fetched the ax and began to chop up the corpse. Chop your leg off to get out of work, will you? Die when I need you to bring in the wood, will you? The old man, leaning over a cloud, watched the old woman chopping up his corpse. Give it hell, baby. Give it one for me. When the old woman had finished, she gathered up the pieces and put them into a soup pot. Now die to your heart's content and tell me you can't fetch wood. That's a, it's a true story. No, it's not a true story. Um, okay. Um, how are we doing here? This is called The Cradle, and it is about a baby, sort of. The Cradle for Jonathan, whoever Jonathan was or is. Because it made my grandmother seem older, I was not allowed to become any older myself and spend my life in a large cradle, big enough for a man shaking my rattle and teething ring for grandma's smile. One day after practicing for years, I said, please let me grow up, Grandma dearest. Do you want to kill me, wretch, with your self-indulgence? And so I waved my teething ring at her and she smiled. Sadly enough, this did not save her life. 
I have remained in this large cradle big enough for a man, waiting for grandma to smile at me again. I shake my rattle at night. It sounds like the fire of distant stars. Um, okay, this is the other contender for my favorite Edson poem, and um, it's totally gross. Uh, and, you know, kind of if you don't want to hear something gross, maybe turn your turn turn everything off um and it's also uh i don't know are we allowed to sort of have fun nostalgia for the the dark heart of the pandemic it's it's sort of a pandemic poem um it's called the hemorrhoid epidemic they kill the man's monkey because they think it has infected the neighborhood with hemorrhoids the man thinks the monkey too good to waste even if there is only enough monkey to make one boot. And so he has one boot made and calls this his monkey boot. The boot reminds him of his monkey. The fur on it is exactly like the fur on his monkey. But why not, he thinks. Is it not made from the same monkey whose fur is like the fur on his boot? But since there is only one boot, he decides he'll either have to have one of his legs amputated or have the boot made into a hat. He decides to have the boot made into a hat because he has only one head and will not have to have one of his heads amputated. But when the boot has been made into a hat, he doesn't know whether to call it his boot hat or his monkey hat. The hat reminds him of a boot he once had, but why shouldn't it, he thinks. Was it not once a boot? But that boot reminds him of a monkey he once had. Yet why should it not, he thinks. Was it not made from the same monkey that it reminds him of? He's puzzled. Meanwhile, the hemorrhoid epidemic continues to spread. Okay, we're over the gross part. Um, well, no, there's more gross parts. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read a very strange poem. Um, it, it, so this one involves a tiny bit of, uh, they, they talk a little bit about torture. Um, I mean, look, here's the thing, it's in, it's in, you know he 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 found he found inappropriate things funny and and of course these poems were mostly written a long time ago um anyway this is a really weird poem uh it's called monkey over street's lovely surprise uh this is the third monkey poem i think i've read you um of of many that are in this book monkey over street's lovely surprise the officers go into the monkey house and arrest monkey jim the zookeeper, trying to be as poignant as he can, says, why are you putting handcuffs on Monkey Jim? I'm sorry, but we have an arrest warrant on Monkey Jim. Oh, but that's not Monkey Jim, that's Monkey Charlie. Well, where's Monkey Jim? That's Monkey Jim. No, that's Monkey Jim. No, wait, that one's Monkey Jim, sorry. That's Monkey Sam. There are too many monkeys. I can't tell which one is Monkey Jim. Well, we'll just pick one at random. They all look alike. Who's to know the difference? But they all have names. If you take Monkey Elmer and call him Monkey Jim, he'll think you're talking to somebody over his shoulder and he won't confess. If you happen to take Monkey Overstreet, the same thing will happen. Yes, that's true, say the officers. That's no fun. No one can expect Monkey Elmer or Monkey Overstreet to confess to Monkey Jim's crime unless we torture them. Yeah, but that kind of a confession never seems sincere. Sincerity is really important with confessions. Well, officers, what can be done? I guess we'll just have to torture Monkey Elmer. You're not going to leave Monkey Overstreet out, are you? The officers say among themselves, we can't leave Monkey Overstreet out, not after building up his hopes. Okay, they say, Monkey Overstreet can confess to Monkey Jim's crimes too. Oh, what a lovely surprise for Monkey Overstreet. I just, I love to imagine him reading that somewhere. It's just, the weirdest thing. Oh, what a lovely surprise for Monkey Overstreet. Um, all right, I think I'm gonna read two more and then Peter and I are gonna talk. Um, if I can find two more. Where did my two more go? Um, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so this is called um, Counting Sheep, and this is the third contender for my favorite Edson poem. 
counting sheep. A scientist has a test tube full of sheep. He wonders if he should try to shrink a pasture for them. They are like grains of rice. He wonders if it is possible to shrink something out of existence. He wonders if the sheep are aware of their tininess, if they have any sense of scale. Perhaps they think the test tube is a glass barn. He wonders what he should do with them. They certainly have less meat and wool than ordinary sheep. Has he reduced their commercial value? He wonders if they could be used as a substitute for rice, a sort of woolly rice. He wonders if he just shouldn't rub them into a red paste between his fingers. He wonders if they're breeding or if any of them have died. He puts them under a microscope and falls asleep counting them. And I will read one more uh, before Peter and I talk. This is called, and this is a this is a pretty recent poem from his Edson's last book, Sea Jack, from 2009. Um, so this is called The Gross Situation. A gross gentleman was joined by another gross gentleman, and they began to be very gross together. Management began to feel that it was becoming too gross. It's becoming too gross, said management. What, said one of the gross gentlemen? This area, said management. And we'd better move, said one of the gross gentlemen. Areas of unusual grossness make our thermometers read too high. Oh, please, would you, said the management? The street's a perfect place for it. The street, whimpered one of the gross gentlemen, you forget how prone we are to fever. The street would be fine. How good of you to think of it, said management. Certainly best to get it out of doors, more room for it there. For what, growled one of the gross gentlemen. For gross situations to develop into even grosser situations, said management. The implication is just too gross, snarled one of the gross gentlemen, as each of the gross gentlemen leaned from his chair and pulled a thermometer out of the crotch of his gross trousers. A gross insult huffed the other gross gentlemen as each rose, fitting gross derbies and gloves to his person. And besides, hissed one of the gross gentlemen, our thermometers are reading far too high. All right, that's... Uh... Is it, are we good on time, Peter? Shall we, yeah, let's talk. Excellent on time. Thank you. That was so awesome to hear those, uh, hear those poems read out loud. You do a fantastic Edson. I love it. And, you know, my um, internet popped out for about five minutes and I ran around my house trying to catch it again and I finally did. Um, so I apologize if I'm asking you something that you already heard, sort of covered in that initial period, but um, do you do you remember your first time encountering Edson's work and, and what your thoughts were around that? Yeah, I mean, I was talking about it a little bit before, but I can I can say a bit more. So so the first place I saw Edson was in um, in Natalie Goldberg's writing down the bones, which you know is was this big writing guide from the eighties, and um, I, I suspect a lot of people uh, actually found Edson there because it was a it was a really popular book, um, and Edson was you know, she has a whole chapter on, on basically how he wrote, which um, he told her at a reading that he would write like nine or 10 of these little prose pieces in a, in a session and then keep one or two that, you know, he, he liked. Um, and so she, she was sort of using it as an example of how, you know, how a writer generates um, writing. Uh, and then, yeah, and then, I, and then I got the tunnel. And then by the time I got to college, because this was in high school, you know, the, a couple of the other weird poet kids on campus were aware of Edson and, and the, I don't know, I remember talking about him a little. He's but, but, you know, I, I mean, oh, I just thought, wow, you can make writing this way. You can make writing that's this whimsical. And, you know, I, I, I think I found Edson around the same time that I learned about Monty Python, you know, and mm -hmm. suddenly there was this, like, I was like, oh, it's a worldview, you know, that this sort of absurdist, but 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 there's a kind of morality to, to both of them, you know, in a way, and and I I was sort of struck by it. Yeah, and you know, you sort of touched on it a little bit as far as like the sort of insider outsider 
you know, role, I guess, role of Ed Center, the place that he, you know, that he just inhabited. I don't, you know, it's, it's wrong to say he tried to inhabit. I don't think he tried to, to do much of anything around that, but, you know, he, he is one of those sort of almost like passed along under the table poets. And in a lot of ways, I think, you know, has been so influential on so many people, but almost like people don't want to admit that or, or like talk about him or something, you know, it's, he, he has this funny taboo around, you know, when it comes to real proper poetry, um, but has had such a massive influence. It's, it's a funny little paradox. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I was, uh, reading some of the letters, you know, he was frustrated about it. Um, it took him, it took him a long time to get the tunnel published and he was really frustrated. Um, I think he, he didn't quite understand why he wasn't having more success publishing, um, at least in the, you know, in the, in the, in the nineties, um, you know, but, but he also, um, yeah, I, I mean, he's gross, you know, and he, he, he just, he is not, I don't know. He, he just always had his own gross way of doing things. What were some of the specific challenges? And, and this is sort of bridging off of that discussion too. I mean, what, what were the specific challenges of, of curating in, in this collection? I mean, you know, so, so to be honest, Edson writes a lot. I mean, sort of scatology is is sort of the, the the nice part of it. I mean, there's a lot of really weird sexual stuff. Um, you know, his his imagination was pretty unfettered when it came to that. Um, there's a lot of weird sexual stuff and a lot of weird, um, you know, stuff about marriage. You know, he like marriage for him was this weird sort of fabulous realm in which people treated each other very weirdly and often very badly. Um, and, and there, you know, and, and I think that, that certainly there are attitudes, especially in the early books that, you know, are, are racist by today's standards. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, present the, the I, I mean, just the sort of fountain of, of whimsy that is Russell Edson's imagination, but I also wanted to be sensitive to um, just the things that, just don't feel right today, you know? So, I mean, you know, I, I tried to represent everything in the book, every kind of poem that he wrote, but, you know, there were certainly poems that I read as I was reading all of his books and I thought, well, no, that's not, that's not for 2022. Yeah, and that, that is certainly a, a trick with him. He, you know, he described a process as dreaming awake sometimes when it's with regard to his writing. Yeah. And I think that's sort of that that realm of like, it's almost like a non-judgmental realm that's real soft around the edges of like what can happen, what what can't, and the rules of that. And and I think of that in terms of even, you know, because he does have these, you know, if he if you looked at what he says about marriage and took it on the surface, you'd be like, this guy must be in the most horrible relationship ever, or you know, never been in a relationship or whatever. Meanwhile, and I don't know if you ever saw them together, but he and Francis were incredibly, you know, devoted to each other and were married until he passed away, probably from the time he was maybe in his mid twenties or something like that. And maybe yeah, I mean, I want to get that wrong, but they were together their entire adult lives, basically. I mean, I didn't, I, I never got to meet him or know her, but every book is dedicated to her. I mean, each, each book has a dedication page to Francis. Um, you know, the other thing that I think is sort of worth mentioning is like, he's really, I feel like he's really coming out of this kind of satirizing the, the post-war world of the, of the fifties, you know, I mean that like, it's kind of like the anti Donna Reed or, you know, like it really must've been his reaction to what, what was on TV and what was in the culture when he was a kid. And, um, I don't think he ever got over that, like that, that sensibility. I mean, that, that in a, in a way there's this mid 20th century, um, kind of satire going on through the whole body of work, even up until, you know, the poems from the 2009. Absolutely. And, and his father was a cartoonist. Right, right. His father was, was Gus Edson, who was a very famous uh, syndicated cartoonist in the, you know, I think like in the, well, like, well, first half of the century. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Um, you know, 30, which, which is probably deserving of its own, you know, study at some point when it comes to Edson. But yeah. um, 
I, what would you, and I sort of hesitate to even ask this question, but what do you think his legacy is in terms of American poetry? Is, I mean, is there one? One of the reasons I really wanted to do this book right now is that I think he's really instructive in terms of thinking about like flash fiction and um, d just the short story. I mean, that, that really he, I think he had a really kind of intuitive understanding of how to structure narrative. And if you, if you dissect any one of those little poems as, as tautological and as sort of reiterative as they are, they often have a dramatic arc, you know, that, that poem, the large thing. I mean, there's a way you can trace it kind of building to a climax and then it has a denouement and there's this little sort of tag at the end that's sort of almost like a moral. Um, so, so on the one hand, I just wanted to kind of present him as, as somebody who could speak to, could, could show us how we might make what, what Richard Howard called, um, or, or you know, what I talk about a lot from, Richard Howard had this phrase, he said, verse reverses, prose proceeds. So, you know, verse, when we get to the end of the poem, we start it again. Uh, verse reverses, it's always pointing us back to the beginning. And when we get to, you know, and, and fiction on the other hand makes us want to turn the page, find out what happens next in the story. Um, and so I think Edson is a pretty is a pretty solid example of prose that reverses, right? That that you get to the end of one of Edson's poems and you realize that the meaning has changed, and you read it again, and you kind of get trapped in this little cycle of of try, you know trying to get out of the poem, and you can't in a way. Um, and so I I I mean I don't know. I just I think he really embodies that tension between sort of progress and. Um, it's opposite, you know, and uh, I think it's really kind of instructive for how we think about fiction, especially now when everything is so messed up. But I guess it's always messed up, but yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing I, I always loved about Edson is, I mean, you could just pull out first lines of his and, you know, he, he was certainly pre sort of writing workshop, but I mean, in a way, I think he came up with these first lines wherever they came from and then the challenge was what do you do you yeah. know, with a line like that um, yeah and totally. i think the, you know archetypes were running rampant you know through his head through his subconscious they came out in that first line and he had to find a way to get through that and the interesting thing is i always think of edson as a it's sort of it's a geeky little thing but he's sort of this pioneer this master of the ellipses you know ending yeah. his poems on an ellipses and the only other person who to me uses ellipses even close to as well was uh, Louis Ferdinand Celine who mm -hmm. used them in great effect but it's such a random thing to think of like somebody who, who mastered the ellipses but he did yeah no he, I mean he like in the same way that Emily Dickinson sort of invented her own dash you know um, mm -hmm. I think Edson has his own ellipses that, that, you know, for him, there's this way that, you know, the poems end and they don't end, you know, that they, it's, it's like, I think what he wants to communicate is you're being sort of re released into a world in which this will all happen again, you know, um, I mean, I mean, he does have a kind of moral vision, but it's a moral vision in which people just people repeat their, their sins. Um, yeah. And there isn't really a way out of that. Um, and I think that's what, you know, as you're saying, sort of drives you back in, into yeah. the poem. If they, if some of these just ended on a period, it would be, you know, it, it sort of almost frees them from the land of, of fairy tale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit, you know, and that there is no tight moral ending. There's not even a period. There's just, no. you sort of pop into somebody's weird fever dream and now you're like released back into his or maybe your own fever dream, but, but you're there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and you're just left with it. You're kind of stuck, which is where yeah. he wants. And the the monkeys, you know, is such a obviously such a recurring thing. I, what what are your thoughts on Edson and his monkeys? I mean, uh, you know, th there's a lot of poems in which the monkeys get sexualized, kind of a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, but I think that he thinks that the, he thinks people are monkeys. I mean, that's it. You know, he just thinks we act like monkeys and um, he's, he likes to show us how we act like monkeys, you know, by showing us monkeys acting like people. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, monkeys look like people, but they're hairier and he thinks that's funny. And he just thinks they're funny, you know? Yeah. He also just, he, he indulges what he thinks is funny a lot. 
um, which is sort of instructive too, I think. I think absolutely. There is, you know, we're, we're watching somebody who is amusing himself as well. And, it, and that's, yeah. you know, we don't want to start and end there because there was much more going on than that. But I think if it didn't amuse him, he wouldn't consider the poem done. Yeah. He wanted, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to get a chuckle out of his work. And Boa published uh, his collection, The Rooster's Wife. Oh my gosh, it must have been 2009 now. I, no, that it was yeah. before that. It was the one before that. So here I can, I can look in the book, it says. Yeah, please do. But anyway, I'll, as you're doing that, I'll say like, I remember being on the phone with him and going through and, and him reading, you know, reading these different poems back and forth and asking him some questions about them. And he would just, you know, you'd sort of say, like, why did this happen? Or why did you, because it's funny. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I mean, he's, yeah. you know, he, he, wasn't, he didn't bristle at any sort of like, you know, at any, any feedback at the same time, I was, I was not going to be, you know, instructing Edson how to write an Edson poem by any means, but any sort of, you know, hint of like, let me question you about this. He just, you know, he didn't, he didn't care one way or another. He just, but he wanted to be amused by his poems. I don't know that anybody could write the poem that would amuse him besides himself, you know? And so it's like, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to do this to entertain yourself too? And I mean, Simic in, in his little forward talks about how Edson would just hang out in his attic, you know, late into the night typing his poems and Francis would hit the ceiling with a broom because he would be laughing so hard. And she right. couldn't sleep. And, and, you know, he wasn't part of a, a community. He wasn't teaching on a campus. He, you know, he did certainly give readings and he gave great readings by all accounts. Um, you know, there, there's one awesome story of, I think it was probably in the seventies of, Edson giving a reading and this was back when you could smoke everywhere and so he had a cup of water on the podium and he's reading and he's drinking the water and he's smoking a cigarette and he's ashing into the water and he's taking a sip of the water and he's reading a poem and drinking the water and ashing into it and you know people are just sitting there like riveted and meanwhile he's reading these hilarious <laughs> poems everybody's cracking up and you know you just realize I mean he was he was a true eccentric you know and an, an iconoclast and and it wasn't you know it, it wasn't it was for entertainment, but it was also like just who this guy was. Yeah, you know? yeah. But there's a there's a writing tip for for anyone out there. If you want to write really well, drink ash water. Drink ash water. I yeah, think that's what yeah. this really comes down to. At yeah. The end, of the, at the end of the day, I had uh, I had the good fortune to have lunch today with another prose poet named Christopher Kennedy, who loves Edson is, a, is an excellent prose poet and, and definitely worth people checking out, especially if you like Edson. But another quick Edson story that he has shared is that Edson was reading, he ran the MFA program at Syracuse for years there. And uh, so it was overseeing the Raymond Carver reading series there. And he had Edson come. And so he was checking into helping Russell check into his hotel, which I think was usually probably Francis's job, but she wasn't there at that time. And, and so the person at the desk says, you know, how many room keys would you like? And so as Chris tells it, you know, Edson sort of got this twinkle in his eye and he said, well, how many can I have? <laughs> the person at the desk said, well, you can have as many keys as you want. And he said, well, then give me a million. <laughs> And, you know, there was just this pause and this silence. And then, of course, Chris let, let this person off the hook. But again, I think this is just how Russell went through the world. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Um, there's two questions in the chat. Shall I? Oh, yeah, please. Um, where did the chat go? I had the chat. On the iPad app, the chat's pretty hard to find. Um, Here, let me can you find see him because i can see him if you can yeah no i, I yeah um so th this is from from one of my students um hello Etan. uh and he's just asking if i can speak a bit to how edson impacted my writing um and and in particular my my, my book cradle book which is this little book of fables that was actually the first book i did with boa way back in 2010 when things were different um uh yeah, I mean, I, you know, as I said, I think when I when I found Edson, it was around the same time I found Monty Python. A couple of years later, I found Zappa. And it was this sort of like, I was like, oh, this is a way you can see the world, you know. And, and then, you know, later I sort of found the surrealist painters. and um, but, but I just, I was sort of amazed that you could just make stuff up and that you could 
um, you could just build on the stuff you made up to make up weirder stuff. And it was really just freeing to me to, 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 to understand that. And then to see that there was a whole body of work that exemplified it. Um, you know, uh, Cradle Book came out of a, a real, just, I just, a sudden excitement about that idea. Like, oh, I could just make up stories. Um, and I'm not a fiction writer. I'm not very, you know, I have trouble doing anything that is takes a long time. Um, but but I just, I, I was really excited by that idea that you could just make things up and make up a little story that had its own rules and you had to sort of enter it and, and learn the rules and then you got sort of popped out the other side. Um, and then, you know, as, as I got a little older, as I, as I you know, in, in, the, in the middle aughts when I was coming up as a poet, there was a lot of thinking about what prose poetry was. Um, and, and certainly amongst my, my peers, there was a lot of, like, we were always trying to figure it out. Like, is it, is a prose poem a little story? Is it some kind of experimental thingamabob? Is it, is it, is it meant to be nonsense? Is it meant to be musical? Um, and, and so Edson has always been one answer for me, you know, which is sort of like elegantly written prose that, um, that, it, that, that it is sort of powered by whimsy. Um, and, and, that, and that fundamentally mirrors the short story, you know, that, that it's not just a random thingy. It's a thing that is built like fiction in almost a satirical way. It's, it sort of satirizes fiction. I love the idea of Bonnie Python and Frank Zappa and Russell Edson. I mean, it's a very much a shared sensibility. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I mean, not so much with Monty Python, but certainly Zappa and Edson share a number of the same problems, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, scatology and um, the way they, you know, at their worst talk about women. Yeah. But there's, there's also a lot of other stuff to think about with them. Yeah, they just so belong together, and I've never thought of, of, of those three together, and it makes absolute perfect mm -hmm. sense when you cluster them. Is, do you say there's another question in there too, Craig? Well, there's there's another one from Eitan. Uh, so, I, uh, Craig, you spoke of Edson's use of tautologies and repetitions with a slight twist on the previous line. Can you speak to what he's achieving with that technique and what we might learn and borrow from it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's. I mean, he's he's interested in a very small way in the kind of theme and variation thing that, that happens, you know, like in a fugue or, or like what happens if you make it just a little bit different. But the thing is that like what, what I feel like the, the, the writerly challenge for Edson always must have been was like, how can I start somewhere ridiculous, go somewhere really unexpected and then get back to where I started? Like he, he doesn't want the poems to progress. And so the narrative challenge always seems to me to be how do you take it somewhere really far afield and then swing back to the beginning in a way that, that still feels like it's got a plot? Um, and, and, and so I think, and, and Peter, you were saying something to this effect too, you know, about the first lines. Like, I think Edson liked to back himself in the corners and then the successful poems were the ones in which he got out in a satisfying way or in a way that made him laugh. You know, can I start with the weirdest title or the weirdest first line? make a story out of it and then kind of get out. And, and um, again, I've always found that challenge sort of instructive. You know, like if you force yourself to finish the thing you started, where, how do you get out? Um, and he has so many solutions for that. And though a lot of the solutions really are just to repeat the first line, which, um, I mean, that's another thing that I sort of looked for in editing. I, I, there is a sense that like, I don't think a collected Edson would work very well, right? Because there's there's a lot of poems that do the same thing. Um, yeah. And so I I was often trying to find the ones where he ended or, or, or where, where he pursued a slightly different strategy than, than kind of what was his old reliable strategy, which was just to kind of restate the first line and leave. Yeah, I think there's also that, I mean, I really do think that, that and he spoke about dreaming a lot, you know, with his work too. So. I mean, when you think about it, we, we can attach a narrative to a dream and it makes us feel a little bit better, but the truth is there isn't a narrative to a dream. There's just fragments right. and right. strange, you know, non sequiturs. And, you know, I, I think he, he embraced that idea of, and there's also something sort of hypnotic about repetition. Totally. You know, 
totally. that sort of sing songy effect too. So, you know, you have the this and that and this and then this and that and this. And before you know it, your brain is sort of kicked into this mode. So you have the repetition that is hypnotic. And then this strange dream like anti logic. And he puts you into a place where, you know, this is Edson's world. I think that's like, you know, the, the ability to do that is incredibly powerful. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he almost, he hypnotizes you so that you'll accept the weirdness of what's what's coming. The other thing, you either will or you won't. I mean, that's that's yeah. you know, it's kind of, kind of like with Zappa or with Monty Python. Like right. you either think that's funny or interesting, or you don't at all. You know, there's right, not a right. lot around with that. Right. Um, one of the big revelations for me in editing this book was uh, the what was his sort of second full length collection, which was actually a fine press edition called What a Man Can See from 1969. And it's the only book that really seems to me to be different from the other books in that I think he must have let himself really pursue that dream logic idea, like the, more so than the rest of his body of work, those poems uh, just drift in really weird directions and don't resolve. Um, and and it, it, it was a book that all the poems were accompanied by wood etchings from another artist. It's a very strange book. And, and worth getting off the used book market if you can find it. Um, and, and there's a handful of poems in here, but that's sort of the place where I think he, he most let himself go and have that. Well, he also, you know, and it's interesting to think about him later on being a little maybe puzzled by not having a strong interest in something like the tunnel. You know, his work was, was published by New Directions early on or you know the, the folks at Black Mountain published his early work well, and they were incredibly influential in the poetry community so you know it's and, not like he was in some obscurity no and, and more than that in the 70s Harper and Rowe published him I mean right. they they published a big new and selected called uh, The Intuitive Journey which is an amazing book um, and then they published uh, uh, like another small volume I mean he was he was publishing with a trade house. Um, yeah. So I think, it, it, and again, I, I'm sure that then, you know, coming to have something like the tunnel and, and having all these poems from all these different places, it probably was a little frustrating and a little, a little bewildering. Um, and that's, you know, and, and I will say for that, I'm so glad that we were, that you put this book together, that we were able to, to bring this out. It's something that you and I have talked about between ourselves for probably 10 years or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's really fun. I'm going to uh, I'm going to bail out now, and if you would leave us with one more poem, that would be wonderful. So good talking. And, yeah, you know, we'll talk. We'll talk more Edson later, among other things. Yeah, let me see if I can find one. Um, what am I going to read? Um, okay, now it's just me, so I have to talk. I have to talk about it. Um, I. I was going to read a poem. Okay, so here, this is called Antimatter, and this is actually the poem that Edson, I mean, that Charles Simic quotes in the, in the forward as like a, a really exemplary and beautiful poem, and indeed it is. Uh, so this is called Antimatter. On the other side of a mirror, there's an inverse world where the insane go sane, where bones climb out of the earth and recede to the first slime of love. And in the evening, the sun is just rising. Lovers cry because they are a day younger and soon childhood robs them of their pleasure. In such a world, there is much sadness, which of course is joy. And you guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this and I, I will see you somewhere online or in life soon. And thank you, Dan and, and writers and books. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, I want to thank Peter uh, and folks at BOA Editions. Um, buy the book. The link is in the chat. Little Mr. Poe's Pro. And I want to thank everyone for coming out and uh, have a great evening.